set up defensive positions in a hedgerow field. The storm that devastated beach facilities was just starting, so the rest of the troops remained on board. After several days, the men on shore located the 1115th Group Headquarters, but it was over a week before disembarkment was resumed. Bill Shanley recalls C Company's arrival. The only thing about the battalion history that I think can be corrected is that C Company did land D day plus four. And the other uh, two platoons, besides the platoon I was in, I remember very vividly that we were looking for headquarters company. And we did not find headquarters. So we knew that we were there alone as far as the battalion. I do not know if A Company or B Company was with us, but I know that the entire company of C Company was there. And then uh, someone um, found us in bivouac belonging to the, the uh, corps that was running the 29th Division and gave us some assignments, road assignments. By July the 4th, the entire battalion was assembled in bivouac just south of the small village of Govan about 13 miles from Omaha Beach. From the beginning, the bivouac area was subject to random artillery fire, so there was plenty of motivation to get that foxhole quick and deep. This is where the 82nd Marshal, uh, when we all got together after coming up off the beach, we we're 300 yards south of Govan, in exactly the spot that uh, is described in the history of the 82nd Engineers. This is the area. I think you should. So it was a dirt road 50 years ago, but this is a small road that we traveled to our first. Uh, uh, when we first arrived uh, at the beach uh, and, and went to the and got off the beach, and we saw the hundreds of not thousands of dead bodies waiting burial, that really struck a chord uh, uh, and made the fact that this was war very, very vivid. And then check Charlie. Remember him? Oh, yeah. To drink a Calvados. If you weren't on guard duty, you'd drink a Calvados, and you could, uh, you could sleep through bed check Charlie. One night, I had a, be I had a beautiful foxhole all lined with uh, burlap bags, and... Uh, in curtain out of a sh out of a uh, six by six on the bottom, and two shelter halves over me. I had a little tent over my home. I woke up one morning, my tent was gone, and my end curtain was on top of me. And uh, found out that a 500 pound bomb had hit the other side of a hedgerow, and picked me up and turned me completely over. <laughs> and I never woke up because I did. Two mouthfuls of hell. To look at the beach and see these soldiers stacked up like cordwood. Like and we went up to the 29th Division, and that's where we were working. That's when we started working, and they couldn't find a place for us, and they finally stuck us in a field. We dug a foxhole, and uh, we slept in a foxhole. In a foxhole, there was mortars coming in. I don't know if you remember that, but there were mortars coming in at the time. Did you want to stop for a minute? And uh, I hung my field jacket up because it was not conducive to being a foxhole with me. And when and those bees buzzing around, me, I found out later they weren't bees; that were shrapnel. And my my field jacket was actually cut with slits in it from the um, from, from the shrapnel. There was cows, you know, in the cow. There was a vine field. You could by seeing the dead cows developing on the pattern of where the mines are. Mm -hmm. And we had those mine detectors and so I'm going through with that. And the guy next to me said, don't take another step. Said, what's, what's the matter? I, I don't know who it was. He said, look down at your foot. It was another trip by. I, no, I should be dead by That's now. Right? You know, the other one in between. Yeah. The 19th Corps became operational on June 13th and took up position between the 5th and 7th Corps. The 29th and 30th Divisions formed the primary units of the Corps. Upon arrival, the 82nd was placed in support of the 29th Division. 
The battalion's mission at the outset was the removal of mines, road repair, and setting up water points. In early July, the battalion constructed a bypass to a treadway bridge across the Beer River at Ariel. On June 30th, the Corps' forward drive towards St. Louis was halted due to a shortage of ammunition and supplies resulting from the Channel Storm. The front was at La Possadiers, about six miles forward of the 82nd bivouac area at Govan. The 29th Division's drive towards St. Louis resumed on July the 11th. On that day, the 82nd moved up to provide close support to the 29th Division frontline units just south of Cobain. The first platoon of Company C was assigned to the division's 121st engineers, and the first platoon of Company B was dispatched to support the 116th Infantry. These units of the 82nd were now coming under intense mortar and artillery fire for the first time. Other units sweeping for mines and repairing damaged roads were being constantly harassed by German fire. On July the 15th, the 116th Regiment began its attack on the Martinville Ridge, from which German spotters could direct accurate and devastating fire. The 175th was covering the left flank, while the 115th Regiment was attacking westward from La Lazerne. The 3rd Battalion of the 116th led the attack. They came under strong enemy fire. Seven tanks were quickly knocked out, and the attack came to a standstill with limited gain and very high casualties. B Company's first platoon mission that morning was to blow the hedgerows with charges of TNT. A few days before, they made sharpened sticks to be fastened to the sides of the 50-pound boxes of TNT, which were to be planted against the hedgerow. It was apparent early on that explosives alone would not do the job, so tanks were fitted with sharp prongs, once properly placed, could tear open the hedgerow, and then complete the opening with explosives. The intense fire, however, prevented the effective use of armor that day. Yeah, I think we were supposed to be uh, infantry at the time, and, and we uh, we were supposed to clear out a hedgerow, blow out a hedgerow, and uh, let this uh, tanks go through. And uh, I don't know whether it was a tank or was a jeep or what it was, but uh, coming up the road, is, and we knew uh, the lieutenant knew we were zeroed in, so he tried to direct him off the road. And when he did, it, a mortar shell come in and uh, got hit direct hit on, on Rico and killed him. And then. Uh, his buddy, Pascoris, he, he must have went to Zerk because he picked up his rifle and come out of his foxhole and said, I'll kill him, and I'll kill him, and he got, he got a mortar shell, too. But I don't know whether he died. We moved into a hedgerow uh, field just before dawn, and we were ordered to dig in. It was comparatively quiet, the artillery and small arms in the distance, but nothing in our vicinity. At daybreak, however, we were still digging in, when mortars and artillery began to rain in. And I remember flattening myself against my foxhole, which was long enough for my body, but only about 18 inches deep. The fire was intense, and it continued most of the morning. Each barrage would have a dozen or more shells, and I could hear the shrapnel tearing into the trees and the bushes just over my head. At some point during the early morning, Private Al Greco was sent into the road to direct traffic away from incoming fire when he was hit and killed instantly. And a few minutes later, Private Spacoris, a friend of his, incidentally, was hit as he tried to leave his foxhole. I remember at one point getting hungry, and every time I raised my head to open a can for my K-rations, another barrage would come in. I finally became disgusted and threw the can away. Staying alive was a bit more important than food that morning. And I remember the man in front of me. He had his rifle laying alongside of his foxhole. Shrapnel ripped the stock to pieces, but he didn't get a scratch. Because the 116th Infantry in front of us was unable to move that day, our mission was scrubbed, and by early afternoon we were able to move back and regroup. But we had experienced over five hours of unrelenting shelling. The next two days were more successful as the 29th moved to the outskirts of St. Lo late in the afternoon of July the 17th. As the division moved, so did the 82nd. 
And in the first 72 hours of close support action, the 82nd had taken nine casualties, one killed and eight wounded. The stage was now set for the assault on the city. A task force from the 29th had been assembled at Cobain's and moved out at 1,500 hours on the afternoon of July the 18th. Moving quickly, the column, led by a flail tank and other armor, and constantly harassed by artillery fire, reached the city within an hour. Defense of St. Lowe was mostly from artillery and snipers left behind to slow up the advance. By 5.30 p.m., just two and one half hours after leaving its bivouac, Task Force C had secured the city of St. Lowe. While most of the structures had been destroyed, it was the network of roads and the enemy's communication center that made St. Lowe such an important objective. After taking St. Lowe, troops of the 29th moved into a rear area rest center, their first break since D-Day. One week later, on July the 25th, after a buildup of supplies, the stage was set for a breakout from the hedgerow country. Commencing at 10.30 a.m. on that day, 3,500 Allied bombers pounded German positions for over three hours. The sky was black with planes, with wave after wave carrying out the greatest saturation bombing of the war. Even though we were several miles away, the ground trembled from impact. The sad was that bombs accidentally hit some of our own troops, including General McNair, who was killed in that raid. Three days later, on July the 27th, the 29th Division, rested and now completely motorized, was ordered back into the line. On that same day, the 82nd received its first major bridge mission, to put the 29th across the Beer River, just south of St. Lowe, near the village of Candle. Shortly after midnight in the early morning of the 28th, Battalion Headquarters sent out two recon parties to identify potential bridge sites. Within the hour, B and C companies in separate convoys also moved out. B Company's mission was to provide security at the bridge site. C Company was to sweep the roads and clear mines to the site, and A Company was to move in at daybreak to begin construction of the bridge. All units on the road that early morning came under a German air attack, during which Lieutenant Gruen, leading one of the recon parties, was wounded. The streets were clogged with debris. All units had to leave vehicles at St. George's, Montuc, and proceed on foot through the city. The bridge site was ahead of consolidated infantry lines, so Company B had to set up defensive positions on the south side of the river, sharing the site with a motor squad from the 30th Division. The bridgehead was secure at 6 a.m. <laughs> 